Welcome everybody. Um, my name is uh, Jack Deckers. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Animal Science in Animal Breeding and Genetics at Iowa State University and a co-PI on the, the AG2PI uh, project, uh, Agriculture Genome to Phenome Initiative. And this is our, uh, our, our third field day. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, this project, um, the website is right there, and you can also follow us on Twitter. I also also should introduce Dr. Nicole Scott, who uh, is the the program specialist for the project, and she does all the behind the scenes along with others, um, coordinating uh, all the all the activities. Um, so next slide, Nicole. So uh, when you go to the website, you get all the information about what we're planning and, and uh, the different activities, four activities, seed grants, which you'll hear more about uh, relatively soon, uh, training workshops, conferences, and then this activity, activity field day. So this is our third field day. The first one uh, launched the project. The second one was about how to communicate across disciplines and in a virtual world. And this is our actually our first actual field day where we um, ask groups or individuals who do interesting work in this whole area of relevant to genome to phenome to, uh, to give an open house about what they're doing. And uh, uh, we're very excited about the, the group of speakers that we have today. Uh, next slide. which will be about uh, Fido Oracle, uh, a case study in automated, uh, automating phenotyping. And this is a very exciting project um, that is ongoing at the University of uh, Arizona uh, in the, uh, the labs of uh, Dr. Duke Pauly and uh, Eric Lyons and others. And we have uh, uh, four speakers who will be, who are working on this project, young scientists who, uh, um, are doing a lot of interesting work and uh, will uh, will give this presentation and they'll it's it's in uh, divided in sections and there will be opportunity to um, for them to answer questions that you can post in the chat as as they present and um, and then they'll answer those questions as they go along so I'll introduce the the four speakers um, so the first picture on the left that you see is uh, Emmanuel Gonzalez he graduated from uh, the Pacific Lutheran University with a bachelor deg bachelor's degree in biology and now works in Dr. Duke, Duke Pauli's lab at the University of Arizona. And for this project, FIDO Oracle, <clears throat> Emmanuel is responsible for developing open source code and distributed pipelines that focus on understanding plant growth dynamics. His ultimate professional goal is to develop modular tools that growers can use to grow their crops more sustainably. Uh, second, person pic pictured there is uh, Aryan Zarei. He received his Bachelor in Computer Science from Shahid Bahesti University in Tehran, Iran. And he's currently pursuing his PhD in Computer Science at the University of Arizona and uh, looking at applications of deep learning and computer vision methods in the medical and plant sciences field. And for this project, his role is uh, designing mach machine learning, computer vision and statistical models for geocorrection and stitching of high resolution RGB uh, image data. Third person pictured there is Travis Simons. Travis uh, is an undergraduate in biology uh, at the College of Coastal Georgia. And he also worked closely with Emmanuel, um, who is one of the speakers, uh, as a virtual phenomics intern, uh, which is part of uh, Dr. Duke Pauli's lab at the University of Arizona. As part of, the, of this team, his primary contribution is the development of a distance-based coordinate matching algorithm to track plant, plant growth over time. So we'll hear about that. And then the final speaker is uh, Michele Cozy. He's a second year PhD student at the University of uh, Arizona under the direction of uh, Dr. Eric Lyons. He received his bachelor's and master's in agricultural sciences from Nagoya University in Japan. And there he worked on the genomics of two African wild rice species. And in this project, his contributions include development of the scalability infrastructure and of processing infra infrared data. So we're very excited to have them uh, uh, speak to us. And um, I will turn it over to, um, I think, Emmanuel. OK. 
Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. I first want to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Deckers and Nicole for the great introduction and giving our team the opportunity to present our research to this community. It really is a great honor. Now before uh, moving along, I want to remind everyone that there will be a poll. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a polling button. So if you guys could please take the time as I present uh, to answer that poll, it would be very helpful to us. Today, I will be describing our data processing pipeline that we have built in order to process large amounts of phenomics data coming from this, the gantry, the world's largest plant phenotyping robot. I would also like to highlight that although what we will be sharing today is focused on plant phenomics, a lot of the tools and processes that we are developing can equally be used for animal science research which we know is facing the same amount of data, if not more. The gantry was built by the Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA-E, in 2016, and used for the TerraRef project, which concluded in 2019. Our team is continuing to use the gantry under the Open Award to advance plant phenomics and to use machine learning algorithms in order to advance plant science research. Our project seeks to leverage the sensors on board the gantry to transform plant breeding by using remote sensing to quantify plant traits such as plant architecture, leaf chemistry, water use, and other features to more intensely study the phenotypic landscape associated with abiotic stress tolerance. The gantry enables us to capture complex phenotypes on a spatial temporal scale not previously accessible. But more importantly, it allows us to do this in real world conditions, as you can see on the image here on the right hand side. This is critical because drought associated phenotypes are entirely dependent on the environment in which they are expressed and are also intrinsically linked to the daily environmental fluctuations which modulate phenotype expression. In addition to the biological focus of this project, we also aim to develop large scale data sets for the plant science community. We recognize that not everyone has access to a system like the gantry. However, the scale, resolution, and annotation of our data makes it valuable for those hoping to develop machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms. Our data can provide the training sets for those types of algorithms. Now, we are often asked why Arizona? And obviously, we are not a significant state with respect to the US's agricultural output, such as states in the Midwest. However, we do have something that is unique, an environment that is fantastic for phenotyping. Given our environment, we are able to grow three crops per year, maximizing the amount of data we can collect using the gantry. But additionally, we have a stable, high light environment with minimal cloud cover and precipitation, which you can see on the right hand side of my screen. These are ideal conditions for both imaging and proximal sensing. Now, to give you an idea of, of uh, what this environment is, is it's basically, you know, one of the things that happened over this last summer is we only had 2.5 millimeters of rain for the entire season. Now, you can see on the picture on the right hand side here, it looks very hot. And that's what really makes these conditions all perfect for studying plants under these conditions and to evaluate how drought affects large populations of plants. In this video, you will see the gantry construction over time. Now the gantry took about three and a half months uh, to be constructed. Now, this is also the perfect timing to appreciate the weather patterns of Arizona. As you can see, some days are cloudy, but overall, most days are hot and sunny. Now, 
One of the things that it's important to know is that the gantry was built as a large prototype. Now, this means that there were numerous problems right from the start. And most of the problems arose from the fact that the gantry itself was not built for durability. Many of the materials were not designed for the intense heat of the Arizona desert. We can exceed temperatures of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, today we leverage this prototype to transform the way we see plants. One of the goals of this project is to develop free and open source data processing pipelines so that researchers around the world can get the most out of their data and to also help address issues facing our agricultural production systems while also promoting sustainable agriculture. Now, we are well aware that most other uh, projects are also generating terabytes of data. And this is thanks to data generation and collection becoming quite easy and inexpensive. However, the real challenge is in turning all of these data into knowledge so that we can pull out information for scientific insights. Now, this is what our pipeline seeks to address. It is important to also understand our limitations in phenotype extraction. Latent phenotypes extracted using sophisticated machine learning algorithms provide a deeper understanding of plant growth dynamics that would have otherwise been missed. And this directly relates to our second project objective, which is the identification, characterization, and quantification of genetic factors contributing to abiotic stress resistance. As we are all well aware, climatic change, constrained crop inputs, and fierce competition for freshwater resources mean that our agricultural plants and animals must improve in order to cope with these environmental constraints and to become more climate resilient. To achieve our project goals, we leverage the gantry. The gantry is a semi-autonomous robot with three axes of motion. Data collection is targeted, meaning that a sequence of actions are planned and programmed in C Sharp. Now the operator is able to monitor for quality control. In our case, this, monitor, this operator is named Jeffrey. And Jeffrey is responsible for making sure that when these scripts fail, uh, he is there to restart the gantry. Now, the failing of these scripts can be due to a variety of different uh, environmental conditions. And it's also important to note that the operator is also responsible for ensuring that the environmental conditions at the time are favorable for scanning. To achieve our project goals, uh, we also have to take the design and operation of the gantry into consideration. Now, the design and operation of the gantry poses unique challenges in and of itself, not only for design, but also crop management. Regarding the design, the field is constrained by the large rails on the east and west side, which means that the field is laid out as a very long rectangle which you can see pictured on the left-hand side of my screen. Now, in the desert, this leads to a very strong heat island effect, where the edges of the crops are much warmer than the central parts of the field. And you can see that, again, on the left-hand side of my screen. Now, these spatial effects have to be accounted for in our analysis. It's also important to note that the field is oriented north to south in order to minimize changing sun angle direction. Now, from a more crop management standpoint, the rails along the sides of the field greatly limit what forms of in-season mechanized operations can be performed. The greatest limiting factor is the spraying of agricultural chemicals since a standard tractor and boom setup are too large and potentially damaging to deploy. To overcome this, we employ a spray drone that has made life much easier and allows us to better manage crop pests like sugarcane aphid or flea beetles pictured on the far right of my screen. We also rely heavily on good old fashioned manual labor.
to get a lot of our tasks done. The desert environment also means that we focus a lot of our efforts on maintaining and monitoring soil moisture as stress can develop rapidly under these extreme conditions. Now here in Arizona, we have uh, what's known as the monsoon season, which brings about days of intense rain and lightning, which would have the potential to ruin the gantry. When the weather conditions are potentially damaging, the gantry is parked under a metal wiring, which was observable in the gantry construction video. Now, the hope here is that uh, the gantry will not be struck by lightning, but the metal wiring will. And oftentimes, non-standard solutions are employed in order to solve gantry-related challenges. For instance, uh, the gantry has become stuck, and in order to pull it out, we have had to use trucks. Uh, so all of these kind of highlight how non-standard solutions are really important for this project. There are also significant repair costs that come with a platform such as the gantry. Now, it's good that it's unique, but this also brings a significant repair cost in that many of the pieces that go into the gantry have to be customized. Now, off to the right-hand side here, you can see the degradation of wiring sheath. And this is something that we have to constantly check in order to ensure that the gantry is performing at its optimal performance. Despite the costs, the gantry is a powerful platform. And what do I mean by powerful? Well, it's powerful in the sense that multiple sensors are housed within one single platform, as you can see in this slide here. We have an array of different sensors ranging from 3D laser scanners to thermal, PS2 fluorescence, hyperspectral, and stereo RGB sensors. Now, the maximum data volume coming off of the gantry can reach up to 10 terabytes of data. Our typical performance, however, is one and a half terabytes a day. Now, at the bottom of my screen here, you can see different examples of all of the data coming from each of these sensors. Our stereo RGB sensors at the bottom left allow us to extract plant sizes through the use of pixel area for each individual plant. Thermal sensors allow us to determine temperature fluctuations over the growing season for each individual plant. Chlorophyll fluorescence sensors allow us to determine the photosynthetic efficiency of a particular genotype. 3D laser data gives us a three-dimensional reconstruction of plant architecture, which allows us to then determine plant height, bounding volume, and leaf areas. Hyperspectral imaging gives us the ability to extract phenotypes ranging from SIF or solar induced fluorescence, as well as early disease detection. Now, we also get the question of why does this matter in other fields? And the reason for that is that many projects out there are already using uh, phenotyping platforms, such as drones, picture on the right-hand side of my screen here. Data collection is becoming cheaper and faster. And because of this, current processing approaches are already a current bottleneck. Complex phenotype extraction requires significant computing resources, ranging from high-performance computing to cloud services and even local resources. Now, we have uh, faced many of these bottlenecks early on, but many other projects are already facing them or will soon face them as well. One other field that is already facing this problem are the animal sciences. The animal sciences have a high data volume, and through the use of distributed computing, we can speed up processing. The animal sciences and plant sciences share a common goal of automatic phenotype extraction. As you can see pictured on the right hand side of my screen here, there are two examples of what's currently being done in that field. On the top, you can see an example of facial recognition software used to detect Betty the cow and track Betty the cow over a series of time points. 
For example, you could also have other efforts such as the one shown below, which includes extracting different phenotypes ranging from the length of an ear to the diameter of an eye. All of these efforts are important and it's important that we also consider how we process our data. Through the use of distributed computing, we can launch these machine learning algorithms in an efficient way and speed up the pace at which we can extract and ultimately analyze our phenotypic insights. So now I would like to pause and take any questions related to our phenotyping platform. So if you have questions, then please put them in the chat. Maybe I can start with a question, Emmanuel. Uh, it was very well, very well done. Appreciate uh, uh, all the details. And you know, it's interesting to see how uh, yeah you run into things that you hadn't thought about uh, when you start with a project like this. Um, so wh where does do you know where the funding comes from for this? For this uh, Yes, so that mainly comes from different projects such as uh, DOE, as well as uh, specifically our ARPA-E open project. Okay, good. And then there's some in the chat. I think you can see them. Or... Yep, of course. So there's a question of how do you monitor soil moisture? So throughout our field, we actually have a series of neutron tubes. And this is where our good old fashioned manual labor uh, comes into play. So someone has to go out there and stick a sensor uh, to determine soil moisture at different depths. Now there's a, another question, uh, which is, are there, are any of the data sets going to be made public? And the answer is yes, of course. Uh, that is one of the main focuses of this project. And at the very end of our presentation, we will be providing the links uh, to where you can find all of our data this would include uh, raw data as well as process data. Okay, and it says, are the data sets available now? And if so, how do we get them? So again, we will be providing links. Uh, and yes, we have some process data that will be available to you as well. How is color calibration done? Uh, so I believe this would be related to uh, RGB. So uh, the sensor itself, uh, we have a basically a script that uses a manufacturer provided uh, color calibration for our RGB images. Do you have any plans to test new sensors on the gantry as they are developed? That is one of our main focuses of this project as well is to be able to use different sensors. So for example, uh, we recently used a different hyperspectral camera, which uh, was a Resonon hyperspectral camera, which was not necessarily built into uh, the gantry when it was built, uh, but we did uh, successfully deploy that. So we are very interested in uh, adding new sensors or replacing sensors as well. Okay. How frequent uh, do you take data? Uh, so that depends on the sensor itself and also the project objectives. So uh, for example, some sensors are ran uh, two times a week, others are ran less frequently. Uh, one of the sensors that we are particularly interested in uh, is the PS2 sensor or the chlorophyll fluorescence sensor that I mentioned earlier. Uh, because that is a big project goal, we run that pretty frequently, which is two times uh, a week. So again, it just really depends on the project goal as well as the sensor itself. Are the data sets that are going to be made available updated in real time? The answer is it is near real time. So we process our data on a high performance computer and McKelly will talk about that uh, in the next section. Uh, so once that data finishes processing, we then send that up to our data storage uh, website and that is made uh, available. So I would say it's near real time. How is this better than using a drone? How large of a field can this cover? So um, the reason why, and I wouldn't say that it's better than a drone, it's, it's a different platform, right? 
And the reason for that is because we can stick a whole lot of sensors into one single platform. That's really the key here. So for example, you can't have uh, a LiDAR system, a multi-spectral system, and an RGB system all on one drone. So that's really what the gantry uh, provides, is that ability to be able to house all of these sensors in one platform under one field. And to scan that field, uh, basically be able to customize the script of, of the scanning. So if you want to run PS2, sometimes you can do that. If you want to run 3D directly after PS2, you can also do that. Okay, the Emmanuel, can we move on to the next section just for time-wise? I think these are great questions and I would invite anyone who has some really, you know, deep questions that they would like to have answered to email those um, and we'll provide answers to you after the fact. Thank or you. at the end of this presentation. All right, then um, I'll take it from here. Um, I've noticed that some questions actually were related to data storage and uh, the data availability. <clears throat> I hope that uh, I can answer these uh, either now or at the end. So uh, before I continue, actually, I have, uh, I don't have the, I'm not host, so I would like to see the results of the polls. Uh, I host, can uh, please share these results? and the poll and share. I am co-host now, okay. Okay, so um, you might have noticed that a lot of these questions were actually uh, data related. So yes, uh, seems like a lot of people do collect uh, image data and um, yes, a lot of people seem to just get around one terabyte of data with uh, a few uh, over 10 terabytes, between 10 and 50, and again, a few over 100 terabytes of data. That is something that I will be addressing in, uh, in my part of the talk. And how long does it take to process your data? Uh, this is a, an interesting graph that I see here. Some people take hours, some people take weeks. It's interesting to see that some people take years and um, that's also another thing that Python Oracle addresses, the time speed. And uh, I'm going to talk about how to uh, speed up, possibly uh, speed up uh, your data processing. And uh, how you store your data, cloud storage. Some people do uh, notebook storage, the old fashioned way. And the local computer, okay. Uh, local computer being the most better. Well, thank you very much for, um, the polls. I don't know if, can I end the poll? Yes. Thank you very much for your polls. And these are all, you should be able to see the results here. And these are all questions that I will try to be answering uh, in uh, my section as uh, well as having one more poll for you later on. And uh, I want to start by saying that normally when you work on a project, data structure and storage is often overlooked with data volume not surpassing the gigabytes. As we have seen here, there's a lot of people uh, with data that doesn't surpass 10 gigabytes whilst uh, some people are under one terabyte. However, when you work with a machine that generates up to 10 terabytes of data per day, you quickly need to start thinking of what is the best way to store and move your data. Next slide, please. All right. This is a quick map of how uh, our data flow pipeline looks. And um, again, before we go forward, I want to stop and uh, take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the team. All right, so very small but very interdisciplinary team with agricultural engineers, Python coders, uh, data analysts, and uh, data scientists, and plant scientists, excuse me. The Gantry team here on the left is made up of Bob Strand and Jeffrey Demiville that look after and around the Gantry. Sebastian Caleja and Bruno Rozzi help uh, with the Gantry and field setup. This part of the operation is coordinated uh, by one of our PIs, Dr. Duke Pauli. On the right, we have uh, Sean Davey and Dr. Eric Lyons, which is our other PI, that helps with the IROD setup and data staging. 
Then there is the Fight Oracle team, made of Travis Simmons, Arian Zare, Emmanuel Gonzalez, Holly Ellingson, and Dr. Nathan Handler. We are here to look at the data and process all of it. Lastly, we want to acknowledge that this project is a collaboration between multiple institutes, which include the Donald Danforth Center, St. Louis University, and George Washington University. So let's get back to uh, data. After the gantry collects the data, the data is moved to a cache server at the MAC, Maricopa Agricultural Center. Here the data is compressed, as well as undergoing a series of checksums in order to check that all of the data is there. The compressed data lives in a cache server for around three days before being transferred to the Cybers data store. Uh, for the ones that are not familiar with Cybers, Cybers is a free open source workspace with collaborative data-driven technology. It is used uh, worldwide from students and professionals alike in order to carry out data analysis on a variety of sciences ranging from genetics to astronomy and physics. Cybers gives its users the possibility to store uh, large quantities of data in its data store, which uh, we leverage to store our data. A lot of you have answered that you store it on a local computer. Well, although it's always safe to keep data in multiple places, um, local computers, you know, they tend to lose data. I've had personal uh, experiences with uh, a hard disk breakage. So Cybers is a good option if you opt to go for a free science-driven uh, cloud storage. All right, so another thing that it's worth keeping in mind is not only where you store your data, but also the tool that you use to transfer your data. We use IELTS, which is uh, very integrated in cybers. And it allows for efficient transfer of large compressed files, which in turn is our main method to store our data. Additionally, it is executable through the command line, which is essential for working with uh, HPCs and, work, uh, and workspaces that do not have access, that do not give access to a GUI, a graphical user interface. Um, now that we've talked about data transfer, I want to talk a little bit about the data storage structure. Next slide, please. Data storage needs to be logical, uh, such that not only users can access it, but in such a way that we can automate code to store and retrieve uh, information in an efficient manner. We store all of our data in various levels, ranging from the raw compressed files to the final processed data. We also keep all of the intermediate process work. As a pipeline, we cannot take the raw data and extract information from it directly. Uh, there are intermediate steps that we have to take in order to extract the data. Different pipelines will have different amount of intermediates. Within each of these folders, uh, we separate files by seasons. Um, as we, like in the example here, we have season 10 and season 11. And uh, from within each of these seasons, we store files in, uh, according to the sensors they are in. For example, RGB, uh, thermal, and uh, 3D, as well as the other sensors. And from within each of these folders, again, we store them by scan dates, starting from the first day all the way until the last day. All right, so uh, now that we have talked about data transfer and data processing, I have another question for you. Next slide. How much time would it take to process a single season worth of RGB data, which is roughly 50 terabytes on a four core regular lab computer? And by process here, I mean taking all the way from raw data to the quantifiable phenotype. I will be sending out another poll, which um, you have a minute 
to present, uh, sorry, to, to respond. I can see some of the answers coming in already. This is really fun seeing the graph go up and down. All right, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Remember, this is 50 terabytes of data. All right, I'm going to end the poll here. And um, a lot of you seems to be thinking that it can take a few days to answer this. Uh, some of you weeks and uh, some of you years, whilst a few have answered hours well, it can take up to 55 years. So good job, whoever uh, guessed here. So how do we get around this problem? This is a lot of data and uh, to answer it, we have made Phyto Oracle. Phyto Oracle is a series of pipelines that allow us to scale processing power whilst cutting down processing time. It's based on CC Tools WorkQue, a software that's developed by the Thane team at the University of Notre Dame. WorkQue uses a four-man worker framework to distribute work between a main node and worker nodes, increasing processing. Here's a schematic of how Phyto Oracle works. The user connects to the main node on the HPC, uh, where the data is downloaded via iRod. The main node then distributes data to worker nodes to be processed. The more the worker nodes, the faster the processing time. Data is then transferred back to the main node, which, is, which compresses the data and sends it back to Cybers through iRod. The user can then access not only the final data set, but all of the intermediate data generated from Phyto Oracle through Cybers using iRods. Next slide. So I'm not going to give you a poll for this, but uh, how much time do you think it would take Phyto Oracle to process a single season worth of RGB data? Well, it's, it will only take Phyto Oracle six days which is a massive improvement. Now that we looked at uh, the framework, let's look at the pipelines themselves. All of the Oracle pipelines follow uh, this general workflow. Raw images are downloaded. Then the GPS coordinates are corrected according to the metadata. The images are then stitched together, forming a full field mosaic. From the earth mosaic, agricultural plots are clipped. These plots are separated by plant genotype. Finally, data is quantified as here in the example. For more information, Emmanuel will later go into more detail on each specific step. It is important to say that each pipeline is able to carry this out thanks to two pieces of software, Docker and Singularity. All of our uh, container use Singularity to run this control on the HPC. Uh, this slide actually concludes the data transfers and storage step. And uh, I'll be taking questions, if you have any, before we move on. Right. If there are no questions, um, I'm going to give it over to Arian Zare, which is going to be talking about one of our most important steps, the image or the mosaicing. Okay. Thank you, Michele. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this seminar. So in this section, I'm going to uh, discuss the different steps that we take in order to stitch the images together and generate uh, ortho mosaics. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so as Michele and Emmanuel both briefly mentioned, um, the field that is scanned by the gantry is organized into agricultural plots. And within each of those agricultural plots, plants of a specific genotype are planted. 
uh, and as again Emmanuel and Michele mentioned, um, they, this project has many goals, and um, among those goals, um, one of them is to be able to detect individual plants, track them through time, measure different phenotypes of those plants, and finally um, associate those phenot uh, phenotypes to the genotypes and find the correlations between those. So in order to achieve these goals, it is really important for us to have clean plot level mosaics. And the best practice to generate those plot level ortho mosaics is to generate a full field ortho mosaic and then crop that full field ortho mosaics to each of those agricultural plots. So on the right hand side of the slide, you can see an example of a full field ortho mosaic, which is the long image and a zoomed in version that corresponds to a plot level ortho mosaic. Uh, so if, if we generate the full field ortho mosaic and then um, crop to the plot of ortho mosaics, we get to use all the available pieces of information to keep everything in place and um, overcome the challenges that we face. And also we can use all the available computer vision techniques. Next slide. Okay, so before diving into the steps of image stitching, I would like to discuss a little bit about the challenges that we face and also talk about a little bit um, about the data. So the images that are coming off the gantry are associated with some initial GPS coordinates, but those GPS coordinates are noisy. And um, this noise comes from three different sources. The first source of the noise is a conversion uh, error. So initially these images are, the locations are captured in a relative coordinate system. And the reason for that is uh, that it is not possible for us to attach a GPS sensor to the camera box. And um, because of that, we first capture the locations uh, in a relative coordinate system and later on we convert it into GPS. So there is a conversion error here. The second source of the error is some delays in triggering the cameras. Again, due to the hardware and software limitations, um, Oftentimes we see a delay in triggering the cameras and the locations at which the images are captured are slightly different than the locations that the gantry believes the images were captured. And the third source of the noise is uh, missing images. So it is really rare, but in some scans we have some missing images. And again, that, that's gonna introduce a, a new, another source of error. So altogether, because of all these sources of noise, we cannot naively, I mean, we, can, we cannot naively stitch these images using these initial GPS coordinates. And um, as you can see on the image, uh, on this slide, this GPS error is not uniform across the field. So we cannot um, do a magic and remove the noise and stitch them together naively. Next slide. Okay, so we are not, uh, we can realize that we are dealing with the large scale image stitching problem here. And in computer vision, when it comes to stitching images in large scale, one of the problems that people will definitely face is the problem of having drift and inconsistency throughout the whole uh, ortho mosaic. So just imagine that you are stitching these images iteratively one by one. And throughout this process, if you make a minor mistake, these mistakes can accumulate and propagate throughout the ortho mosaic and generate a bad result and um, inconsistency in the final image. So what's the solution? The solution is to use all the available pieces of information and all the prior knowledge that we have to keep everything in place and prevent uh, drift. So one of the most important pieces of information that we have are these white bucket points. So these are called ground control point or GCP. And these are white bucket lids scattered around the whole field. And um, we measured the center, the location of the centers of these white buckets. And um, we can just detect them in the images and pin them in their known locations to prevent the ortho mosaics from any drift. And also we have other pieces of information, as you can guess, 
the initial noisy GPS coordinates are another source of information that we have. Because if you imagine after stitching these images and geocorrecting them, each individual image is not gonna uh, move uh, a lot from its initial location. So that's gonna be another piece of information. And one last thing that I would like to address in this slide is that um, the same method, the same concept uh, can be applied to other types of data sets, to other images that are captured by drones or other types of cameras from indoor um, scenes or outdoor farms. Um, and you can uh, do, do the same thing, place uh, ground control points and keep everything in place in your final ortho mosaic. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so in this slide, you'll see the um, stitching method in high level. So I'm gonna walk through each of these steps. So the first step for us is to read those noisy GPS coordinates from the uh, geotiff tags uh, within the images. So these are the, some metadata associated with each of the TIF images that we have. Then we um, go into the, um, we go into each of these images and extract important visual features and match them together based on their similarities. So these important visual features are like locations on each of the images that are visually important. After finding the correspondence between the important key points, we can calculate the geometric relation between each pair of overlapping images using those matched key points. And um, then we can go there and find the images with GCP lids and anchor them in their known location. And finally, we can put together all these available pieces of information, which includes the noisy GPS coordinates, the locations of the ground control points, and also most importantly, the geometric relation between the images based on the visual key points. And we can solve for the corrected coordinates of the images. And then we can, at the final stage, we can save these corrected coordinates as geotiff tags. And at this point, we can naively stitch these images using softwares like GDAL um, uh, based on these corrected coordinates. Next slide. Okay, so the, the problem that we've addressed um, it should be considered really important because we have um, a lot of attempts to run different commercial softwares such as Metashape and Pix4D to stitch the gantry images, but all of them fail. And the reason for, for those failures, I believe, is um, both the fact that we have very low amount of overlap between the images, and within those overlapping regions, we get very few distinct visual features. And most importantly, the scale that we are dealing with is really large. So we are, each scan um, has somewhere between 7,000 to 10,000 images. So that's really uh, uh, a lot of data. So uh, now that we can stitch these images correctly and geocorrect them, uh, as you can see in these two images uh, on the right side of the slide, um, we can now go there, identify individual plants, measure different phenotypes, and um, just proceed the next steps of the pipeline. Next slide. Okay, so here in this slide, you'll see uh, a very important thing. So the method that we de developed is called Megastitch. And uh, as you can see here, uh, Megastitch can, uh, can be invariant to uh, the illumination effects. So uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a scenario in which uh, the shadow of the camera box is present in parts of the images, all the images. And despite having that shadow, as you can see on the zoomed in version um, on the right hand side, plants are uh, lining up perfectly and scientists can go there, individually track them and measure different phenotypes like canopy cover. And on the left hand side, you can see an example, a scenario in which um, a shadow is present in parts of the field, possibly that's the shadow of a cloud and again, despite having those illumination effects, the error is um, minimal. Next slide. And here uh, you can see a, a complete comparison between before and after 
geocorrecting the images. So on the um, left side of the slide, you can see um, an example of naively stitching images using uncorrected GPS coordinates. And as you can see, we can, um, I mean, you can see an staggering effect. The plots are not lining up perfectly. And if you zoom in, you can see a lot of um, cut uh, lettuces. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a, an example of a geo corrected and stitched images using Metasheet. Next slide. Uh, so another thing that we um, tested was to uh, like run Megastitch, our developed method on drone images and also other types of images with more advanced uh, and more complex uh, transformations like uh, perspective projections. And in all those cases, we realized that Megastitch is fast and robust to um, outliers and drift. So I guess this is the last slide for me. Uh, so if you guys have any questions regarding image orthomosaicing, I'm very happy to answer those. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, so again, if you have questions, please put them in the, in the chat. Um, I have a question. I was interested, you know, being from uh, animal science, I was interested in your comment about uh, applications to farm animals. And, and I can see, you know, if you have animals in a pasture um, and you have a drone um, that you know you need to uh, patch those or stitch those together and even in a, in a barn maybe less of an issue in a barn you know there are systems where a camera is on a rail that uh, goes across the pens right and so yeah there's some stitching needed there also uh, but of course the biggest challenge for animals is that the animals move right that is but, but that's I guess that's a different problem right to deal with uh, yeah that that is correct and um it is a problem it is a challenge but it only can uh, can be a small challenge if you if you uh, just take your camera and start you can see you, I'm definitely sure that everyone has seen this, these examples people do different stuff with the panorama uh, on their phone so you can just take pictures and a, a person can just move and go behind you and go to the other side and be present in that panorama for like two times. That is possible. I mean, this is definitely a challenge that we haven't been dealing with, um, but that, that, that's a great point. The only thing is that you, may, you might get different instances of the same animal in the final organization. That is correct. So got uh, I see a lot of... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what was that? Sorry. No, go ahead. You have some questions in the chat. Sure. Okay. So uh, early on, I saw an, uh, a question about the packages that we use. So people can correct me, but we are using um, OpenCV. Um, we are using um, uh, uh, well, Emmanuel. Can you can you remind me of the name of the software that we are using for RCNN? Uh, Detecto. That's Detecto. Detecto. I've heard. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and we are using GDAL for um, reading the GeoTIFF and saving them, and um, Matplotlib, all the Python libraries. So those are the packages that we are using. And okay, so let me answer these questions. Uh, so for correcting the shadow, that's a, that's a good question. It's been a, a, a challenge in computer vision. There are different methods for uh, correcting those shadows. We also developed uh, some um, methods for like removing the shadows, but since we are dealing with a scientific problem, um, I guess it's, it's better not to manipulate the contents of the images and just let them be what they are. Um, does the gantry make shadows on some of the images? Yes, uh, in some instances, the, the gantry make, I mean, the, the camera box is actually casting a shadow on parts of the images or on, on complete uh, on all the, on the, all the area of the image. So that, that's correct. What are the input requirements for mega stitch number of images and GPS coordinates? So that, that is correct. So mega, I should mention that mega stitch can work without any uh, geo references. So you can just give it some images that are captured by your phone. So um, in, in terms of input requirements, it's not required, but if you give it um, GPS uh, coordinates, 
of the images, corners of the images, and those GCP lids, it's going to be more accurate. Does Mega Stitch output also point clouds? Uh, at this point, no, but uh, that's a great question. If we are using um, like stereo cameras, cameras with two uh, actual cameras, it is possible to generate depth map and point clouds. Um, how do you use the white buckets for correcting GPS coordinates? Uh, so um, the, bu the white buckets, um, that's a great question. The, the, the white buckets help us to uh, keep everything in the correct place. So throughout the whole field, we have, depending on the season, we have different number of white lids. But um, if you see, assume that we have 30 white buckets scattered uniformly across the field, we can just pin those images that they contain these white buckets into their correct GPS locations. And then um, um, it, we can just stitch the images together and this would prevent any drift and all these plants are gonna be at their known location. So how do you use, you answered that, are the image data sets available to the public? That, that is correct. As Emmanuel mentioned, all these data are available and they are organized into uh, like different levels of processing. So we can go there and take a look at the raw images, stitched images, and geo-corrected, and that is correct. Yeah, okay, to, so we're uh, gonna. Yeah, it's go they're ahead. available uh, post stitched, and um, for some pipelines, also pre stitched too. That is great. Um, so, if if there are not any questions, okay, I see another question. Do you s do the same scheme with uncorrected images every time you scheme? Uh, I don't. No, what do you mean by skew? Well, I think um, they're asking if the error is uniform that you're seeing, Arian. Uh, oh, so like, yeah. no, no, the error is not uniform. So, so every time it scans, scans is different. Yeah, every time it scans, it's, it's different based on the different conditions that we have. Okay, so uh, if there are not any other questions, I'm just going to hand it over to Emmanuel. Thank you for all the great questions. Um, so now that we understand how these images are geo-corrected, I now want to shift our focus to phenotype extraction. So the central goal here of this project is to take all 20 or 30,000 plants that we usually have in a given season and be able to extract as many phenotypes as possible. And in order to do this at the single plant level, we really have to detect every single plant so we can focus in and collect the size of each individual plant, the plant height of each individual plant. Uh, so that's really the central goal here. And the way that we do this is through the use of FOSS, or free and open source software. FOSS provides a level of robustness, flexibility, and modularity that is unparalleled. And the biggest benefit is that other researchers can leverage our code without the need for subscriptions. Each one of our pieces of code is containerized into Docker or Singularity containers. And what that means is that you don't have to worry about dependencies. Now, in our particular use case, we aim to collect the geo coordinates for each individual plant through the use of machine learning. And off to the, my right hand side here, you can see a whole lot of red dots. And each one of these red dots corresponds to individual plants in our field. And if we were to zoom in, you can see that each one of those individual dots corresponds to the centers of every plant. Now, it's not only important that we collect the centers of each plant, but also the bounding box predictions from our machine learning algorithm. These bounding box predictions are then converted from image coordinates to geographical coordinates which then allow us to extract even more phenotypic insights from our other data sets. So to give you a better idea of how all this works, I wanna walk you through our stereo RGB workflow. Step number one is a conversion of bin files to geotiffs, and these bin files are what the gantry outputs. Geotips are images that have geotags, similar to what Arian uh, was talking about in his section. These geotags are then geocorrected 
and then they're clipped to the agricultural plots. And ultimately, we uh, perform plant detection. Each one of these steps is running through a tool known as Makeflow. And I like to think of Makeflow as a recipe, similar to if you were baking a cake. You would specify your inputs, your flour, your eggs, your oil. And you would also specify your output, X amount of cake. And something very similar is happening here in our pipeline, where we specify all 9,000 plus images and we specify our outputs, being those plot clipped orthomosaics or full field orthomosaics. And the benefit in this is that we can accurately know that we have the correct corresponding number of outputs that we would expect given the number of inputs. So now let's go through each one of these steps in a little bit more detail. So you can see here are some examples of GeoTIFF images. These are small tiles that represent a given area in our field. And as Arian mentioned, the original geotags have some error associated with them. So the next step is to actually geocorrect them. Once we've geocorrected them using Megastitch, their GPS locations are much more accurate. These individual tiles are then aggregated together and ultimately clipped to the agricultural plot using a GeoJSON, which is very similar to a shapefile. Now, once we have these individual plot clipped images, these represent one genotype in our field. These plot clipped images are then fed through our faster RCNN detection network to be able to identify and detect every single plant. Now, you can appreciate here the variation uh, of the plants that we had for this particular season, where we were growing hundreds of different lettuce varieties in our field. Some plants were green, others were red, and even others were some combination between brown and green. So this is really an important problem, and we have to train our detection networks very cautiously in order to ensure that each one of these varieties can be picked up. So in our efforts, we trained using thousands of images that were manually labeled by all of the team here. And we can all speak to how lengthy that process was. But ultimately, what you get is a detection network that gives you a prediction. And that prediction is specifically that bounding box that I was talking about earlier. This bounding box is an image coordinates. And once we convert that to geographical coordinates, that is where we can begin to leverage this information to the fullest. Now, machine learning can be used for much more than just detection. So now I want to talk about some of the initial efforts that we have in dry rot segmentation. So dry rot is a fungal pathogen that affects the roots of a plant, and it travels up and eventually causes some leaves to turn gray. Now, in this effort, we manually annotated charcoal dry rot instances using label box. And we use different variations of a UNET structure. And through the use of a fully convolutional network, we can then deploy this on images of varying sizes. Now, in order to increase our accuracy, we perform a filtering step. Now, what this means is that we use an index called the triangular greenness index to remove false positives. So what exactly does that mean? So a TGI allows you to determine which pixels are likely living green tissue and which ones are soil. So once we have made that initial identification, we then completely remove any soil pixels from the equation. So the only thing that the network is seeing is the plant pixels. So those plant pixels are then identified as being either healthy or dry rot. And ultimately here, the goal is to deploy this network on drone-based images, because this would be particularly helpful to both farmers, crop consultants, and other people as well. So now here in this video, you will see a 3D reconstruction of plant architecture. And the goal here is to be able to focus in on each individual plant, as I mentioned earlier in my talk. We want to be able to focus in to one plant and extract as many phenotypes as possible. So now through the use of our bounding boxes, we can then go to each individual plant using that geographical bounding box and clip out one plant at a time. Now, once we have that plant, 
we can then extract a diverse array of different phenotypes, ranging from plant volume to leaf area and leaf angle, among many other phenotypes. Now, it's important to note that tracking one plant in one scan is good, but the idea here is to be able to track one plant throughout all scans that the gantry has actually collected. So now I would like to take a pause and welcome any questions as they relate to plant detection. Thank you, Emmanuel. And again, put the questions in the chat, but I have one. So, um, you know, a, a lot of crops, they, the plants aren't separated, right? So they close like corn, you know, the, they, they overlap. Mm -hmm. so, so is that a limitation of this, um, of this system that, you know, we really only can focus on questions where you can um, have non-overlapping plants? Yeah, so in order to improve the, the accuracy of your phenotypes, uh, one of the best ways to do that is through space planting, right? Which means you give your plants a little bit more space. And that's actually uh, the method that we use for both lettuce and uh, our previous sorghum season. Uh, we made sure that we gave ourselves enough space so that we could be able to go in there and use these bounding boxes to extract out individual plants. And one of the things that we have to be very cautious about is in those instances where some plants are kind of coming into that bounding box, uh, we need to make sure that we remove those plants from our analyses. And that's also something that we're working towards is being able to determine when that does happen. So, so but then does that uh, limit the application of the results? Because I mean, a, a corn plant would grow very differently when it's in a dense field versus separated, right? That is correct, yes. But usually, uh, most of the time, and this really depends on, on the crop, but most of the time you can still extract significant and, and biologically useful uh, phenotypic insights from that data, even though they're being grown slightly different from what they're usually uh, used to. But one other thing that's important to note is that here we've taken individual plant tracking uh, approach, but we, you can also take a plot level approach, right? Where instead of going at the individual plant level, you can also run our code and use it at the plot level. So instead of tracking each individual plant, you would just have plot averages. So in instances like corn, right, where you would be worried about the growth of corn uh, and how you specifically grow it, then you could always revert back to plot level. Okay. Okay, so let me take a look through. How does the system deal with weeds versus crops? So our detection network is specifically trained on instances of whatever plant we're interested in. So the examples that I showed here were of lettuce. So for example, you go in there, you highlight a uh, lettuce plant, and then you highlight also your weeds. And through the detection network, you can tell it which particular thing you're looking for. So with machine learning algorithms, you can train it on just one particular object of interest. You can train it on multiple. And if you do train it on weeds, you can then filter out those instances. Do you have to build a plant model before the phenotyping platform can be meaningful? Um, by, if you can uh, specifically say what you mean by plant model, um, I can answer your question. Um, I'll give you. I, I, I guess, um, I mean, I'm not sure if that's the case, but sometimes um, they, they generate some model of the structure of the plant, if that's the question. Yeah, I mean, so we don't really deal with, I, I think what you're trying to say is the plant model, as you mentioned here, as in plant development. Uh, so we don't do any modeling before the scans. So our 3D laser scanner is just picking up and scanning through and picking up points to then uh, have that three-dimensional reconstruction of plant architecture. How many images are being used for training in your RCNN network? Uh, so we used over 2,000 images. 
And each one of those images had about, give or take, uh, eight to 10 individual instances of a plant. And for now, I wanna give us enough time, so we'll save the rest of the questions uh, for later. And I will give Travis, uh, I will give it over to Travis to uh, cover the last section. Hey, thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, every guys, for uh, coming and pay attention to everything. And the, the questions have been so great so far, so I appreciate that. Uh, so everyone has done tremendous work getting to a place where we have single plant identification for each scan. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Now, I've been focused on relating each of these identifications to one another throughout the season. So why do you want to track a plant? Well, our project is centered around identifying dynamic genotypic differences such as growth rate, temperature regulation over time, and other morphological changes. So in order to do this, we need to not only know that the plant on the left at the start of the season is the plant on the right at the end of the season, we need to know that it's the same plant every time the gantry snaps a picture of it. And since we have 30,000 plants in the field to track, it gets complicated. So complicated, in fact, that full field individual plant tracking on this scale has never been done before. Go to the next slide. To show just how large of a data set we're talking about, this is just five days of identification over a small portion of our field. Each dot has five dots under it, with each dot holding all the metadata for that identification. This data can include things like the plant area on that day of identification. Then if we zoom in, now you can see those five identifications that I just mentioned on the left. But the problem is that right now they're unrelated to each other. That is that there's nothing to tell me that all those measurements on top of one of those plants relate to the same plant. So it relate to the same plant. So if we then look to the right, this will be representative of the ideal tracking scenario. Now we have a unique identifier attached to every day of identification, relating all measurements of a given plant to one another. So how do we get there? Next slide. So we've taken a few different approaches to tracking the plants. The initial way was to think of each identification as a vertex on a graph using latitude and longitude to plot it. We will then plot two days of identification at a time and then pair each day one vertice with its nearest neighbor from day two. You can see this visualized in the GIF on the right. We also encoded some rules such that a pair had to be the same genotype and the closest pair of points. And then we had a maximum distance parameter that kept us from getting maxes, matches across the entire field. However, there were some problems. Like this was a tedious pairwise matching. I mean, you could feed in only two data sets at a time. So it'd be like day one's identifications, day two, day two, day three, day three, day four, in that kind of fashion for the entire season. And since we have a ton of scans per season, this took a lot of time. And there were also some serious bottlenecks with the amount of points we could feed in at one time. So we had to implement a genotype-based searching method where we only consider one genotype at a, at a time trying to make these pairwise matches. But now we are moving to a machine learning approach called agglomerative clustering. We chose this because it has a similar matching criteria to the nearest neighbor approach we took previously. And then it has a distance fresh threshold we can tune to get more or less restrictive clustering. For our application, this distance was an average diameter of one of our plants. And since it was the average diameter of one of our plants, since we would not want to associate points between two different plants. It can also handle all the identification data sets at once, so there's no more tedious two-day matching. Finally, it's modular, meaning that our script is easily adaptable to your research. In our Read the Docs, we've included example sections that illustrate how to modify the script for any experiment where you have categories of semi-static coordinates you want to track over time. Although this approach was specifically designed for semi-static targets, similar clustering algorithms have been used for UAV-based UAV livestock monitoring. We, implement, we implemented this agglomerative clustering method with great results, and we're able to track all 30,000 plants individually over the entire growing season. As exciting as the approach this is, let's see what we can do with all these tracked plants. Here, we have an ArcGIS online application that is a culmination of all the efforts we've talked about. We have a full field orthomosaic that was plot clipped, then each of the plants were then identified and tracked over time. Since all these plants are identified and tracked, we can then select a singular plant using the menu in the top left. In this case, we've selected Diplomat 127, which is a singular plant in the field. 
This allows to see us the plant, see the plant incre area increase over time in the bottom left graph. We can then select any plant and easily and reliably view the growth chart or pull out any of this data. It will also let us do one of my favorite things in the world, which is watch plants grow. You can imagine through the use of other available software being able to track plants like this in a greenhouse setting quite easily. But this plant tracking task gets so much more difficult when you take these plants outdoors where the environmental parameters, such as significant and inconsistent shadowing of the plants, prevents the use of threshold encode. Now imagine not only doing this outside, but doing this outside for 30,000 plants at a time over an entire growing season. So this is what makes our work a significant contribution to plant phenomics and why we are so excited as we have overcome all of environmental challenges posed by the field and are able to reliably track all 30,000 plants individually over the entire season. Well, we can take these flat data sets uh, and take it a step further. As the types and data, I mean, types and volume of data change, the way we interact with it will be changing as well. This is why we are developing a VR point cloud visualization tool for data, data exploration and rapid hypothesis generation. Here we see one downsampled pass of the, 3D, the gantry's 3D line scanner. We are quickly working toward a full field visualization. Inside this environment, researchers would be able to walk the field and inspect the plants from anywhere in the world. Then they may select a plant that looks particularly interesting and retrieve the phenomic information collected by the gantry for that plant. This information could include things like the plant's growth rate as displayed on the right. Below that is an easily manipulated sub millimeter resolution point cloud of that plant. And again, we will be able to do this for any plant in the field. As we walk to another plant, we can see some of the morphological variation present in the field and why it may be interesting to explore the data this way. You can see some are taller, some are shorter, some are more bushy, uh, some are also more fan-like. And then we can also go to another plant that we think might look cool and uh, select that one and bring up its genotypic information and manipulated model as well. We can then start to ask questions that may not be obvious from just staring at tables and graphs, such as, oh, it looks like some of the plants on one side of the field have a higher growth rate than the ones on the other. What, I wonder what's causing that. You can then pull other collective phenotypic data from that plant, such as the photosynthetic efficiency over time to help you answer that question. This will be a practical and intuitive tool for exploring the data and facilitating rapid hypothesis generation. And I'm so excited to be able to share a file with someone and have them walk a field that is over 3000 miles away. And I'll now be taking any questions you have about the plant tracking section. Hey, thank you, Travis. Um, questions, put them in the, in, the, in the chat. I have a question, I may have missed something because I thought that you know, once you have done the, the geo correction, mm -hmm. then you have the coordinates and the plant doesn't move. So, right, uh, it, kind of intuitively it seems like, okay, we know where the plant is, we got a box around it, it's, here's a plant, that's awesome, right? Uh, and it seems like you would very easily be able to say this plant is this plant at this time and you can track it over time. Uh, however, there's a couple of different variables that make that a lot more difficult of a task. Uh, one is that the, uh, when we do the plant identification, that point is the center of the bounding box that's identified. And as the plant grows uh, and what position that plant's in at the time, especially for something with like sorghum that has kind of a, you know, can sway with wind and everything, uh, those points are not going to be exactly in the same spot. Uh, and then also as the plant grows, of course, the center changes and what the network decides is the center of the plant changes. Um, and so even if you did have all of them in a very tight grouping, um, there's still nothing telling you that that group of 5, 10, 20 observations is a singular plant. It doesn't have a name yet. It doesn't have any type of identifier. So you could track each of those data points over time. And uh, so first step is getting them all grouped appropriately and naming them, which is what the agglomerative clustering does. And then uh, being able to scale that to a place where, uh, let's say if we had 30,000 plants in the field and did 30 scans, you know, that's 900,000 data points that we have to group like that, which is a significant kind of uh, bottleneck of how you have to go about searching through these groupings and grouping together to track them. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. So let's take, uh, let's see. Hmm. 
Oh yeah, and also the, uh, some of the plants get cold uh, throughout the season. Uh, so that's another source of variation where uh, midway through the season, uh, that plant not might be there anymore. And if you just you know try to pick the closest ones on uh, points on that day, it might go to a different plant. And so this method also takes that into account and allows for tracking of plants that got cold. Uh, yeah. So how have you managed to link genotypes to phenotypes and how the impact of environmental influence? Yeah, so that's when, you know, the uh, genotype to phenotype initiative is kind of uh, one of the main goals of the project. Um, and, you know, we're definitely moving towards that. Emmanuel, if you would like to speak a little more on, uh, more on that. Yeah, so uh, we are definitely moving towards that. Uh, one of the reasons why we're not there yet is because all of these intricate pieces have to be orchestrated in, in, a, in the right way to extract phenotypes correctly. But we are quickly moving towards connecting these phenotypes that have been extracted, ranging from plant heights, leaf angles, uh, plant area, to genotypes. Now, I'd also, I'd also like to comment on Christine's uh, comment. Uh, yes, we would be happy to share a presentation with high school students. Uh, I think oftentimes when you're in high school or even in college, it's, it's hard to see where these coding skills can be applied to. So we'd be happy to share that with other people. And there was an earlier question to you, uh, Manuel, that I think we didn't get, get to. Uh, any work to build multi-species detection? Yeah, that is something that we are definitely considering, especially uh, like, for example, with lettuce, right? There was quite a bit of variation, uh, but those types of efforts require quite a bit of time. There's a lot of labeling that has to go into it, but it most definitely is uh, a possibility. Mm -hmm. I'm just going through to see how, whether there, because I think in the beginning we skipped maybe a couple of questions. Yeah, I don't remember this uh, from Alan Bray. Do you have plans to test new sensors on the gantry as they are developed? Was that, do you have plants or plants? Plan, plans to test uh, new sensors. Yeah, most definitely. As I mentioned previously, we have already uh, tested new sensors like uh, a Resonon hyperspectral camera. Uh, and that's definitely something that we're considering into the future as well. Uh, you know, sensor technology is quickly evolving, uh, so we most definitely want to make sure that we are testing and making sure that we can deploy a variety of different sensors. And then there was a question, are the plants genotyped and how do you account for the heat island effect? And this is a uh, heat island, that's maybe you want to explain what heat island is, uh, refers to because I'm not familiar with that term. Yeah, so that was uh, what I had mentioned earlier in the slide where the uh, there's a difference between the perimeter temperature and the center temperature. Uh, that's what it's, it looks like an island, right? Uh, so that's accounted for through the use of uh, statistics uh, primarily, and uh, Duke can go into more detail uh, if he'd like. Uh, so Jack, basically um, the heat island effect is that because it's so hot, you'll see that in most images, we have bare field on one side and a black top road on the other. So with you know wind speed and whatnot that carries in a lot of hot air that really affects the edges of the field. So you know doing like a good spatial adjustment using like autoregressive models, um, armor or something like that to basically take that into effect uh, into account so we can better correct for that. Additionally, um, you know because all the the thermal temperatures being recorded at the same time, images and other data are being captured, um, that canopy temperature can be included as a covariate in the model as well. So we can kind of correct for it in that manner as well. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions about anything related to this, this project or how it can be applied to other questions or species? And If not, then I think uh, we're almost out of time anyway, so uh, well, thank first of all, thank the, the speakers for uh, you know excellent uh, presentations and really giving us a very good insight. And I should also mention that 
it's exam week at the University of Arizona. So they're, they're doing this, you know, while in the middle of being in the middle of taking exams. Um, I think this, this was an excellent um, example of, uh, you know, what we need as a for what, what we mean by, you know, having these field days. And this was our first real one. And I think you guys have set a very high bar for the, the ones to follow. Um, you know, really demonstrating uh, um, the scope of uh, a project like this and uh, the different challenges that uh, uh, that um, you have to deal with. And, and yes, um, fill out the poll that's showing right now. Um, you know, it's very evident that it's obviously a very multidisciplinary project you know, where, you, where you need, and this, you know, it's going to happen uh, or is happening for other uh, species also and other genome to phenome related projects. You know, we need data scientists, computer scientists, engineers, agronomists, statisticians. Um, so uh, a big effort and, uh, and I really applaud the team at the University of Arizona of having been able to put this together. Um, so I think, um, please fill out the, the, the poll. Uh, and then um, the only thing that I am left to mention is, uh, yeah, go to the uh, website to look for uh, uh, future activities. Uh, also um, to suggest other topics for future field days. Our, um, our next one will be uh, January 20. So the field days will be every third, third Wednesday of the month from 10.30 to 12 uh, US Central. And the next field day, we're going to switch to animals and going to talk about uh, or hear about the implementation of genomic selection and the future of phenotyping in dairy cattle. Of course, dairy cattle being sort of the poster child for uh, implementation of uh, genomic selection. Uh, and uh, but in addition to that, uh, there's also a lot of uh, um, new phenomics that is being used in dairy cattle. And so we'll hear about that and the challenges that that gives. Also, um, in mid-January, we expect to have our first training workshop, so uh, more of a hands-on um, uh, effort for, uh, for all of us to become fam more familiar with uh, the different computational aspects. And so this will be on an introduction, on the on introduction to computation for biologists, and an announcement should be coming out relatively soon. Also, our seed grants, uh, the RFP is expected to be released in January, so look out for that. Uh, and definitely, you know, if you have any colleagues or others who might be interested in uh, what you saw here or, or uh, anything related to the project, please uh, refer them to our website. Uh, this field day and as, as the past field days, they will be on, um, on, the, uh, on the website. The recording will be on the website and uh, they can be shared with others. Uh, also, a survey went out um, earlier this month or at the end of last month uh, to all of you. Um, if you haven't filled it out, we appreciate if you could fill it out and um, um, and, and complete that by December 23rd. And it's important because that really informs us as a as a team, uh, you know, what what the needs are and what we should focus on. So this is going to be very important as we. Uh, move forward, your opportunity to provide your input. So with that... Um, Jack? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we also have a few announcements, if that is okay. Um, yeah, definitely. A few links out. Uh, is it okay if we share a screen again, Emmanuel? Just a, it's a couple of slides, really. Yes. Um, quite important. Not quite important, but um, it's information that we think uh, people might be, uh, can leverage. Yeah, definitely. Um, Nicole, can you um, allow Emmanuel to share again? Okay. Yeah, since, since we're talking about announcements, uh, we wanted to finish by saying that also the University of Arizona is accepting um, applications for, graduate applications for an NSF and NRT programs in ecosystem uh, genomics for next year. If you are interested in applying, uh, please follow the link or contact us. Um, lastly, we also want to 
give thanks to everybody in the team, uh, the people at the University of Notre Dame, Dr. Douglas Stein and Benjamin Tovar, uh, people that worked on IRODS, Tony Edgin and the Edmonds, and uh, our PIs, Dr. Duke Paulais, Corbus Bernard and Eric Lyons. And uh, at the, finally, we want to close by giving you links to uh, all of our repositories. If you, in case you want to uh, know more about uh, how it runs, how it works. Uh, it's very important to um, please understand that all of this can be used with UAV data too. And uh, you can find the means to contact us in our documentations. You can find all uh, of the software dependencies and um, the, 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 the networks that we use in our containers and uh, workflows. And the, finally, at the bottom, uh, we have uh, URLs that bring to our ortho mosaics, uh, data stores, and uh, ArcGIS maps. Um, thank you, Jack, for this minute. Uh, we just wanted to close with this. <laughs>